nine. Ignition sequence. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. And mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and has come to a final stop. Der Havarie des Kreuzfahrtschiffs Costa Concordia ist nun ein Video aufgetaucht, das zeigt, was in den Minuten nach dem Unglück auf der Brücke des Schiffs passierte. Zu sehen ist, wie unkoordiniert Kapitän Schettino und seine Offiziere vorgingen. Zu hören sind Sätze wie, es gibt einen Riss und Wasser dringt ein. Später berichtet ein Offizier, dass Passagiere eigenmächtig in die Rettungsboote steigen, was Schettino mit einem saloppen Das ist okay beantwortet. Bei der Havarie kamen vermutlich 32 der 4200 Menschen an Bord ums Leben. Bilder, die ein Besatzungsmitglied gemacht hat und man sieht, wie planlos der Kapitän handelt oder eben auch nicht. 17 Tote sind bisher aus dem Wrack geborgen worden, 15 Menschen gelten noch als vermisst, sind aber wohl auch tot und seit dem Unglück werden dem Kapitän heftige Vorwürfe gemacht. Aufnahmen aus der Unglücksnacht. Dieses Amateurvideo zeigt die Besatzungscrew auf der Brücke der Costa Concordia. Zuvor hatte der Luxusliner einen Felsen gerammt. 45 Minuten nach dem Unglück wird hier noch immer diskutiert, nicht gehandelt. Hier geht alles zum Teufel, sagt ein Offizier. Es gibt sechs ausgefallene Motoren. Die Besatzung diskutiert darüber, ob es ein Leck geben könnte. Kapitän Schettino lässt das kalt. Man solle abwarten. Jemand schlägt vor, einen Anker zu werfen und die Schotten dicht zu machen. Auch das interessiert den Kapitän nicht. Hier rot eingekreist entzieht er sich der Diskussion. Er telefoniert hinter der Brücke. Die Passagiere beginnen von alleine das Schiff zu verlassen, sagt ein Besatzungsmitglied. Ah ja, na gut, sagt Schettino. Erst jetzt schlägt die Mannschaft Alarm und setzt einen Notruf ab. Mehr als eine Stunde nach Unglück werden die ersten Rettungsboote zu Wasser gelassen. Während die Passagiere verzweifelt auf ihre Rettung warten, soll Kapitän Schettino das Schiff bereits verlassen haben. Einen Monat nach der Havarie der Costa Concordia haben Einsatzkräfte damit begonnen, das Öl aus den Tanks des Schiffes zu saugen. Die Arbeiten wurden um einen Tag vorverlegt, weil sich das Wetter gebessert hatte. In der Costa Concordia lagern noch etwa 2300 Tonnen Treibstoff, überwiegend Schweröl. Auftritt Anori. Wie ein Vorhang öffnet sich Mamas Fell. Mit verführerischem Augenaufschlag blinzelt das Eisbärbaby in die Überwachungskamera. Die junge Dame lässt sofort ihren ganzen Charme spielen. Für Pfleger Klaus Kühn ist es Liebe auf den ersten Blick. Nori hat ja ihre Augen also Schritt für Schrittweise aufgemacht, nicht auf einmal. Das ging los also mit so kleinen Schlitzen, die man erst gesehen hat auf dem Monitor. Und dann kamen die ersten Punkte, die man so schön erahnen konnte. Und jetzt so nach gut fünf Tagen hat sie jetzt die Augen total auf. Und jetzt sieht sie wirklich schon aus wie so ein kleiner Bär, wie so ein kleiner Kuschelbär. Und äh, jetzt kann man schon erahnen, wie sie später mal, wenn sie mal jetzt weiter wächst, also wirklich mal schön aussieht mit dem Gesicht. Verliebt man sich direkt in so einen kleinen Kuschelbär? Ja klar, logisch. Also das ist wirklich was ganz Niedliches. Man sieht es ja an den Bildern. Also jetzt, sie wächst jetzt und sie kriegt jetzt ihre schönen Konturen. Jetzt kommt sie so langsam aus dem Bieralter raus und so zu kleinen etwas Teenager, wollte ich schon mal fast sagen. Also man sieht, dass die Haare wachsen, sie bewegt jetzt auch die Ohren. Also jetzt geht es so langsam los und ich schätze mal so in einer Woche wird es auch mal so anfangen, da zu probieren, mal durch den Stall zu laufen. Doch erst einmal guckt sich Anori um. Während Mama Wilma ihr Töchterchen sauber schlägt, genießt der Babybär die Aussicht. In der Regel wird die jetzt erstmal nur schwarz-weiß sehen und dunkel und wird sich da so ein bisschen an ihrer Mutter orientieren. Das dauert eine Zeit, bis sie wirklich richtig sehen kann und bis sie wirklich ihre Augen richtig benutzen kann. Sieht sie dann die Mutter schon richtig? Also wir vermuten, dass sie am Anfang erstmal so hell und dunkel erkennen kann, dass sie Bewegung sehen kann. Das können wir auch nur ableiten von dem, wie wir Menschen uns entwickeln oder wie man das bei anderen Tieren sieht. Aber das wird noch nicht richtig viel sein, was sie im Moment sieht. Erst wenn man dann sieht, dass sie auf Aktionen reagiert, auf Bewegung reagiert oder Sachen sieht, findet, nicht nur mit der Nase, sondern auch mit den Augen. Aber das wird noch ein paar Wochen oder Monate dauern. Es ist ein Sehen und Gesehen werden im Wuppertaler Zoo. Auf einem Fernseher können die Besucher inzwischen mitverfolgen, was in Anuris Kinderzimmer so los ist. Was macht die Faszination von so einem Eisbärbaby aus? Naja, sieht man ja relativ selten. Und das ist bestimmt ganz süß und tapsig. 
Ja, absolut süß. Vor allen Dingen ähm, hat er noch einen Berliner als Papa und ich bin aus Berlin. Das passt ganz gut. <lacht> Aber ich bin kein Eisberliner. Ich bin Wuppertalerin, scheint Anori hier mitteilen zu wollen. Sie hat halt schon ihr eigenes kleines Köpfchen. Also wenn ihr irgendwas nicht passt, vor allen Dingen, wenn die Mama ihre Milchquelle nicht so schnell genug aufmacht, dann fängt sie also richtig schön an zu schreien und sie hat ein lautes Stimmchen. Und da benimmt sie sich dann doch schon wie so eine kleine Diva. Ja. Und wie es sich für eine Diva gehört, braucht Anori ihre Kosmetik. Und seit neuestem auch Augenpflege. Im Westen und Norden wurden heute schon wieder leichte Plusgrade gemessen. Mit dem Temperaturanstieg machen allerdings Schnee und Regen die noch eiskalten Straßen gefährlich glatt. Jan Bulich über das Ende der Eiszeit. Meter hoch haben Wind und Wellen die Eisschollen auf Rügen gestapelt. Lange dürften die Ostseeurlauber darüber aber nicht mehr staunen. Es taut. Und die Deutschen, die bundesweit auf Seen und Flüssen den Wintersport entdeckt haben, müssen bald wieder runter vom Eis. Zur Freude in den Notaufnahmen der Kliniken, wo eisbedingte Knochenbrüche für Überstunden sorgten. In den normalen Wochenenden sehen wir etwa 100 bis 120 Patienten. Und dieses Wochenende hatten wir jeden Tag 60 bis 70 Patienten mehr. Heute lagen die Tageshöchstwerte nur im Osten und Süden noch bei bis zu minus 10 Grad, ganz im Westen dagegen schon bei 4 Grad plus. Auf der Mosel bei Koblenz sind Eisbrecher im Einsatz, um den Fluss schon diese Woche wieder schiffbar zu machen. Auf den Straßen sorgt das Tauwetter für zuerst nasse und dann glatte Fahrbahnen. Im Rheingau-Taunus-Kreis rutschte ein Feuerwehrfahrzeug eine Böschung hinunter. Die Insassen wurden leicht verletzt. Die Autobahn 12 bei Fürstenwalde musste voll gesperrt werden, weil ein Gefahrguttransporter quer über die Fahrbahn schlitterte und mit einem Kleinlaster kollidierte. Insgesamt blieb die Lage auf den Straßen unter Kontrolle. Die Streudienste befürchten aber, dass sich die Situation noch verschärft. Ab morgen, übermorgen soll es Regen geben. Da wird also unter Umständen auch noch wieder glatt werden, weil der Boden ist ja noch ziemlich gefroren. Für Entspannung sorgen die wärmeren Temperaturen bei den Gasversorgern, die die Eiseskälte in den vergangenen Tagen vor allem in Süddeutschland in Schwierigkeiten gebracht hatte. Der nun zu erwartende geringere Heizbedarf dürfte die Engpässe beheben. Top. H0 moins une minute. We are into the final 60 seconds. Before Vegas made launch, the VIPs and the invited guests here in Jupiter are beginning to make their way out on the two terraces on either side. There's a wonderful view of uh, the launch pad from here. Countdown proceeding smoothly. Excitement here has been high all week. It's another one of those moments right now as all eyes on the computer screens and all ears at the telephones. As we approach liftoff, we're going to cut away and let you hear the DDO. She'll call out the final countdown numbers. Enjoy the launch. We'll be back after Vega has cleared the tower. A tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage, premier étage, décollage. Boy, did she go up in a hurry. Did you see that? Vega lifting off like a streak from uh, the uh, pad here, unlike Ariane 5, which, which takes her time. The DDO is saying everything is normal up there. 137 tons at lift off. Ariane 5 weighs over six times that much. But these are pictures that are going to go around the world. The maiden voyage. Vega's first three stages rising rapidly. And boy, you saw that in five minutes. The first stage will separate in about 30 seconds. La propulsion du premier étage est normal. Propulsion is normal. The uh, second stage will separate in about three and a half minutes. The third stage ignites uh, shortly thereafter. And the third stage separates in about uh, just under six minutes. We're doing fine up there. Take a look at the uh, left-hand side of your screen. On the upper left, the cursor crawling up the curve. 
there are actually uh, two lines. There's the optimal trajectory and the uh, real-time trajectory, as long as one is superimposed on the other, we're right where we should be. On the lower left, the two lines, A is the altitude, climbing up to 57 kilometers, V, velocity, or speed, 174. There's a separation of the first stage, right on time, and the ignition of the second stage. First stage burned perfectly, jettisoned at about 61 kilometers up. The motor called the P80FW. P80 produced in Colifero near Rome. We'll have a film on that uh, La est coming up. Everything is fine on board. The uh, P80, the first stage, has something new. The thrust vector control system is using electromechanical actuation for the first time ever on a launcher's first stage instead of a hydraulic system. The actuator is a bar that controls the first stage nozzle, nozzle orienting, orienting the thrust upon command from the computer, onboard computer, sort of like the steering wheel. La the, car. Est normal. the advantages is it's lighter, easier to integrate, and cheaper. A world first for a motor of that size. We're in the second stage burn. Weighs 25 tons, 23 are fuel. Both the Zephyro stages, the third and the second stage, produced by Avio. They're loaded with solid uh, propellant before being shipped here to the spaceport. Not very different than what's uh, done for Ariane 5. Both stages, based on a Zephyro solid propellant motors already developed Developed by, by Avio. There's the separation of the second stage. Our speed now 3.8 kilometers per second, as you can see on the left. We are right where we should be. Third stage, four meters long. It's Vega's smallest solid propellant motor, but it has the longest Allumage burn time. The longest burn time, over two minutes. Weighs 12 tons, 10 are fuel. We're approaching the fairing jettison. You'll see the two halves of the fairing, there they are, right on time, being uh, separated, revealing to the elements, the satellites. Fairing protects, of course, the, de la coiffe. the payload from the shocks during Vega's ascent through the atmosphere, and once we leave the Earth's atmosphere, we don't need the fairing anymore. There's Laris, you see the ball with the uh, mirrors right in the middle. La the, est the black and blue box on the left is Almasat, and the other CubeSats around it on the platform. Acquisition de la télémesure lanceur par la station navale Ariane. DDO has just called out, we've been picked up by our first downrange tracking station. That's on a boat out in the Atlantic. We'll have a film telling us all about the new facilities, including the new tracking stations that have uh, come to the base because uh, of uh, Vega. Le pilotage est calme. See, we're burning the third stage, and on top of the third stage is the Avum. That's the uh, fourth stage. That's just under the fairing platform there. Altitude, 166. Speed, six and a quarter kilometers per second. We're coming upon separation of the uh, third stage. The uh, Vega base designed to handle four launches a year. Le pilotage est calme. Eventually. The Vega Launch Control Center, which you saw earlier in the same building that houses the Ariane 5 Control Center. Mission control is provided from the same Jupiter building where we are tonight. That's used for, our, for Ariane and uh, Soyuz launches. Everything functioning flawlessly on board Vega as we're approaching third stage uh, separation. And we'll have ignition of the, of the Avum. The trajectory is normal, the speed is normal, the propulsion is normal. On this uh, maiden flight. And there's the separation of the third stage. Done its job. There's the Avum. And there's the first ignition of the Avum. Our speed now, 7.7 .7 kilometers. We've almost, almost reached our maximum speed. This is the fourth stage, called the Avum which means attitude and vernier upper module. And when Davide gets back, he's going to tell us what that means exactly. But basically, a vernier referring to the precision required by the upper stage 
because the album is designed to deliver different payloads les paramètres du quatrième étage sont into normaux. different orbits and to perform very fine satellite pointing before separating the satellites. The album's main mission begins Le at the end calme. of the solid propellant base, which you saw. It starts maneuvering to reach the target deployment normal. orbit. Everything is fine on board. The DDO calling out repeatedly trajectory normal, propulsion normal, everything nominal is the word here. The album burning, you can see, carrying 626 kilos of propellant in her four tanks, powered by a restartable engine. We're going to have several burns on this first flight. We're in the middle of the first one, which will last uh, until almost nine minutes, almost another two minutes to go. After that, we'll have a coasting phase for some time, which is also called a ballistics phase. Soyuz uses the same sort of procedure. And the second avum burn it will come between plus 48 minutes and plus 52 minutes. And shortly after that, at plus 55 minutes, Laris will be separated. Then we'll have a third avum burn at about an hour and nine minutes. And that lasts for about two minutes, roughly, with CubeSat and AlmaSat 1 separation. You can see the nozzles burning off and on on the album. This is her guidance system. She uses two clusters of uh, thrusters for roll and attitude control. They'll start to work uh, during the ballistics phase. On board the album are all of Vega's avionics, which provide the flight control and the mission management, telemetry, flight termination, power supply, distribution, all of that. The Avum will reach a circular orbit at 1,450, 1,450 kilometers to release Solaris, then maneuvers to lower the perigee uh, to 350 kilometers before deploying the other payloads. This does not mean it'll deorbit directly when each mission is over. It'll be transferred into an orbit with a perigee low enough to ensure re-entry, and that's the case today. Coming up uh, on nine minutes, and uh, that will mark the end of the first album burn. And Davide has returned. Davide, how's the ambience down there in the fishbowl? <laughs> wow, <laughs> what a day. Well, uh, everybody's, uh, <laughs> everybody's still very focused because uh, it's still not the end of the mission, but uh, I'd just like to anticipate it with a great success. I was struck really? by I was struck by the fact that she took off and lifted just like a streak. Absolutely wonderful. Jungfernflug geglückt. Zum ersten Mal seit 16 Jahren hat die Europäische Raumfahrtorganisation ESA eine völlig neu entwickelte Trägerrakete gestartet. Die 30 Meter hohe Vega-Rakete hob am Morgen vom Weltraumbahnhof Kourou im südamerikanischen Französisch Guyana ab. An Bord waren neun kleine Satelliten. Die vergleichsweise kleine Vega wurde vor allem in Italien gebaut und eignet sich besonders als Träger für Wissenschafts- und Erdbeobachtungssatelliten. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS update. It is Monday, February 13th, 2012. You're looking at a live view inside the space station's flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Today's flight director is Ed Van Sice. He and his team have been working for the last several hours with the Expedition uh, 30 crew on board the International Space Station as they work through a fairly busy day on board the orbiting complex, Dan Burbank, who is the commander of Expedition 30, has uh, spent the majority of his day uh, working on cleaning the crew quarters. These are basically the sleep stations that each of the crew members um, live in uh, during their off time on board the uh, International Space Station itself. Joe Acaba, who is a uh, future Expedition crew member, he launches later on this year, is actually inside Mission Control, uh, sort of learning. Uh, on the job as he watches Dan Burbank clean this crew quarters. It's a very valuable uh, experience for the crew members to sit inside mission control and watch as their fellow crew members up in space uh, work around the station so they know what's ahead of them uh, as they get ready for their journey coming up later on this year. Anton Shikaplarov is uh, working with Oleg Kononenko. These are our two spacewalkers later on this week. Uh, the two of them are installing new sensors inside their Orlan spacesuits on board uh, the Russian segment. 
Shikaplarov and Konyanka will be stepping outside beginning at uh, 8.15 a.m. Central Time on Thursday. Of course, we will have live coverage here on NASA television beginning at 7.45 a.m. Central Time. Their spacewalk is going to last about six hours. The main uh, point of that uh, spacewalk on Thursday will be to relocate one of the Strela cranes. These are large uh, telescoping uh, cranes and extensions that are on the outside of the Russian segment. Uh, the crew members use them to uh, move around and to translate and to gain access to uh, various portions of the Russian segment. They're going to be moving one of those Strela cranes from the pier's docking compartment uh, up to the upper portion of the International Space Station in the Poisk module which is directly across from piers. Uh, this is being done in order to uh, get the station ready for the uh, removal and disposal of piers to make way for a brand new segment of the Russian part of the International Space Station coming up uh, next year. Anatoly Ivanishin, another expedition crew member, has been uh, helping his crew members inside the Russian segment this morning uh, as they get ready for that spacewalk we talked about. He will focus the uh, majority of his afternoon replacing the smoke detectors inside the Russian segment. Uh, this is done throughout the year just to make sure that those smoke detectors are working as expected. Andre Kuipers has been busy uh, moving some th things around inside the end cone of what's called the PMM. This is the permanent multipurpose module that was brought up to the station last year. It's a large uh, storage container, basically a very large closet that is uh, mounted to the station and uh, there's quite a bit of cargo up there after the final shuttle missions and all the different progresses that have uh, been visiting the station. So uh, keeping track of things and moving things around and making sure that the station is in uh, tip-top shape uh, is something that the crew members, work, crew members work very hard on. Later on this afternoon, corporates will be working on some of the station's onboard computers and uh, updating some of the software on them. Uh, Don Pettit, Another NASA crew member, part of Expedition 30, has been working on a big experiment called SLICE. This stands for Structure and Liftoff and Combustion Experiment. This uh, is an experiment inside the uh, Microgravity Sciences glove box, which is something that the crew members can actually work on themselves that takes a look at how different flames behave up there uh, in space. Specifically, the SLICE experiment takes a look at uh, where the flame becomes what they call lifted, so it comes up off of the burner due to different flow conditions or the different uh, combustion chemistry that is inside that experiment. The hope of SLICE is to uh, develop uh, better methods uh, for uh, increased fuel efficiency and also reduced pollutants here on Earth. Of course, for all the latest on the experiments and science activities that the crew of Expedition 30 is working on, you can log on to the NASA website. Just go to www.nasa.gov station. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS update. It is Tuesday, February 14th, 2012. You're looking at a live view inside the International Space Station's flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. Today's flight director for this team is Ed Van Sice. He is sitting there at the middle console. Joining uh, beside him as Capcom is uh, Kate Rubens, who is sitting there in the black, and then Rob Hayhurst, who is also sitting beside Kate uh, there on the far left. The Expedition 30 crew on board the station today uh, getting it ready for quite a bit of activity later on this afternoon and also getting set up for uh, Thursday's spacewalk. Don Pettit and Andre Kuipers have been working on an experiment called Neurospat today. This takes a look at how the brain's signals change and behave while the crew is up in space. It tests uh, a few different things, perception, attention, memorization, decision, and action through different tasks. And uh, through that experiment, scientists on the ground can take a look at how the crew members' brain signals uh, change and react uh, while they live up there in space for about six months. Pettit is also continuing to unpack some of the items that uh, came upon the Progress 45 cargo craft. That Progress 45 undocked from the station back on January 23rd, but it delivered close to uh, three tons of supplies uh, for the crew, including some food and some fuel. Uh, so it takes some time after those cargo crafts arrive to get everything unpacked and set up uh, in the proper spot inside the station complex. So Don Pettit will take care of uh, some more of that today. Of course, the big news this week, Oleg Kononenko and Anton Shikaplarov getting ready for their spacewalk coming up on Thursday. 
Earlier this morning, they both climbed inside their Russian Orlan space suits, the two different suits that they will wear on Thursday to check out the different systems and to uh, make sure that everything is ready. Everything checked out uh, as expected and okay. And uh, the suits were declared ready to go for Thursday's uh, activities. We'll have live coverage beginning Thursday morning at uh, 745 a.m. Central Time. That is 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time. And then the spacewalk will begin about 30 minutes later at 8.15 a.m. Central Time, 9.15 a.m. Eastern Time. That spacewalk will last about six hours. Anatoly Ivanishin has been working inside the Russian segment on the Matryoshka experiment. This is an ongoing uh, examination of the radiation environment uh, inside the station. There's a mannequin that has different dosimeters, different other uh, sensors on it. Uh, that detects the different radiation levels and uh, also helps anticipate how the human body uh, absorbs those radiation levels up there in space. And then Dan Burbank just a few minutes ago kicked off uh, what will take up the remainder of his day. He is doing some checkout activities on Robonaut. There you see a live view inside the Destiny Laboratory of the robot. Burbank's going to be checking out all of uh, Robonaut's different joints, moving some things around. He will also then do what is called a force sensor checkout where he will push the robot's forearms in multiple directions. Of course, uh, if you'd like to follow Robonaut, uh, he is Twittering from space, but you can log on to nasa.gov slash station to find out the latest information. Uh, but his Twitter account is Astro Robonaut, so just go to twitter.com slash Astro Robonaut to follow along as all of these activities take place today. Finally, the crew has some crew Earth observation opportunities today. This is a chance for them to look down at the planet below to uh, take some pictures. Uh, today's primary target is Mumbai, India. They'll be flying over that uh, from a southwest to northeasterly pass. Uh, there's what's called some aerosol, which comprises smoke, dust, and industrial pollutants uh, above the city. And uh, you can actually see it from space. And due to the station's path, uh, the fact that they're going to be at what's called an oblique uh, angle, so it's sort of a uh, to the side angle and get a get a side view of it and also the underlying sea surface this presents uh, an ideal chance for them to photograph uh, that aerosol cloud that is out there to uh, hopefully pick up some subtleties of it and give scientists and researchers on the ground an idea of uh, how that aerosol cloud is behaving if you would like to take a look at uh, some of the pictures that the crew has gathered including some of that stunning uh, video of the night passes over north america and canada just log on to nasa.gov slash station. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS update for Wednesday, February 15th, 2012. This is a live view inside the space station's flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. Today's flight director is Ed Van Sice. He is sitting there in the center console beside him is today's Capcom, the voice up to the Expedition 30 crew, that is Shell Lindgren, an astronaut who has uh, been working with the crew for the last couple of hours as the Expedition astronauts and cosmonauts work through their daily activities. Don Pettit, which you see on the far right-hand side, has been taking a hearing test today. This is part of a routine checkup on the crew members. They all participate in this just to make sure that their uh, health is uh, being maintained and to monitor how their bodies react to being up in space for five or six months. He has also been working on what's called MELFI. This is the minus 80 laboratory freezer up on board the station. This is a series of uh, basically lockers that are held at uh, extremely cold temperatures. Here's a picture of one of them with Pettit uh, working there. Uh, they hold different types of samples and other pieces of uh, experiment hardware uh, that need to be held at a very cold temperature until they can be returned to Earth. He's also been working on the Altia experiment, which takes a look at radiation levels aboard the station. And Pettit has also been working uh, on some training, some routine training uh, in his role as the chief medical officer. Obviously, there's no uh, physicians or uh, flight doctors up on board the station, so the crew has to uh, watch over and maintain their own health. So he'll be uh, taking some training uh, for that role later on this afternoon. Andre Korpers has been working on uh, a system called the Muscle Atrophy Resistive Exercise System, or MARES. This is a chair and a restraint system, much like what you would find uh, in a gym uh, here on Earth, that measures and exercises seven different joints to see what happens in space. He is also continuing to clean up the end cone of the Permanent Multipurpose Module, or the PMM, which is basically a, uh, a large storage closet on board the International Space Station. Uh, there's quite a bit of cargo inside of it, so he has been doing some inventory and uh, moving some things around to uh, make sure that everything is uh, where it needs to be. 
He is also continuing some work today on the NeuroSpat experiment. He, uh, he worked on this yesterday as well. Uh, this looks at how the brain's signals change and uh, behave in space. You see him working on it there. It tests perception, attention, memorization, decision, and action through different tasks, as you see him doing there. Oleg Kononenko and Anton Shekaplarov getting ready for tomorrow's activities. They're going to be doing a uh, spacewalk out of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Today they reviewed the uh, procedures for tomorrow and inspected the pier's docking compartment to make sure that all of the tools and equipment are positioned and ready to go. There you see the task list. That first one, the relocation of the Strela boom, Strela number one, uh, that is going to take up the majority of tomorrow's timeline. The spacewalk is due to take about six hours. Uh, that'll take about half of the time. And then uh, in the remaining time, they'll be installing some debris shields on the outside of the Russian segment. And if time allows, they're going to take uh, care of some experiment work on the outside of the station as well. Our live coverage will begin tomorrow at 7.45 a.m. Central Time, 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time, and then the spacewalk itself will get kicked off at 8.15 a.m. Central Time, 9.15 a.m. Eastern Time, and again, it'll run about six hours. Meanwhile, Anatoly Ivanishin has been doing some routine maintenance inside the Russian segment of the station. He is continuing that work as we speak right now. And then the other major task for today involves Dan Burbank, the commander of Expedition 30. He is continuing the checkout operations of Robonaut, the robot that's on board the station. This is a live view. Uh, this work started yesterday to make sure that Robonaut's joints and uh, arms and hands and fingers are working as expected. Uh, some of that activity has spilled over into today. Uh, so Dan Burbank is in the process right now of watching over Robonaut. Looks like something out of a science fiction movie, uh, but this, this is reality as Robonaut checks out uh, his hands and his fingers. Uh, there was a handshake scheduled for yesterday between Robonaut and Burbank, which is a, a very large milestone for not only uh, the uh, crew, the Expedition 30 crew, but also the ground teams here in Houston that have worked on Robonaut. Uh, over the months and years as the uh, first handshake between a robot and a human takes place. Uh, that did not happen yesterday, but it is due to happen today. So we will continue to monitor this during our broadcast hour today. Uh, of course, for all the latest, if that does not happen today, you can follow along and see the video of it on NASA.gov. You could probably situate yourself a little bit better. Yeah, and if you look at the cord, uh, that is uh, routed from the protective ring. It needs to be clear of the uh, steel surface so that uh, it's not in your way uh, when you move out of the hatch. Copy, and it's out. It's completely clear of the um, interface. And uh, Anton, are you finished with your set? Oleg, could you turn on your sublimator, please, because your temperature is kind of getting high. So go ahead and uh, turn on your sublimator at this time. Copy. All right. The handle is down, and uh, the sublimator is on. Copy, Oleg. Okay, and uh, Anton's side is installed, so the protective ring is fully in and installed. Copy. One more time, guys. The cord from the protective ring, is it anywhere near the uh, attachment surface? Uh, it's away, but uh, it keeps coming out, so should we uh, maybe rotate the protective ring somehow so it does get into the opening of the hatch? Yeah, it keeps getting in and out. Okay, can you secure it onto the side somehow so that uh, it's not in your way when you come out? Okay, copy. All right, how about we rotate uh, the uh, protective ring? Anton, you rotate towards me, and I will rotate towards you. One more time. It's getting closer to your end. Anton, a little bit more. Is it stuck, any? 
It's really not desirable, guys, to turn it while it's uh, on the attachment uh, surface. So if you can remove it and then turn it the way you would like to adjust it, then put it back in. Copy. That's what we're doing. All right, Anton, uh, remove your end of the ring. See, it's somehow not budging because it's kind of towards the inner surface. It was installed just fine, started to turn it, Misha, and uh, somehow it's tilted now. Crew, uh, having a little bit of trouble with a protective ring that they install on uh, the the hatch ceiling interface on the piers. That's one of the um, steps they need to go through before they can actually get out of the piers and, and get to work. So they're working through that with a team on the ground in Moscow. It comes to a stop, and it's really, really tight. So basically, no matter how you install it, the cord is going to be in the way no matter what, right? Well, I'm trying to move it a little bit towards myself. Anton, could you push it towards me? Are you able to do it? No, the cord has no more slack left. It's it's tight all the way. Yeah, but Anton, can you take it out of the um, restraint? next to where the uh, protective ring was um, installed before we try to move it. No, it's not moving. It's not moving because uh, the cord is holding it in place. It doesn't have any more slack. Misha, are you copying this? Misha. Yes, I'm here. If we install the protective ring such that the cord is not in our way when we egress the hatch, uh, then uh, we are unable to install the protective ring correctly. Okay, so the cord it comes all the way, it's stretched out to a max, correct? Yes. I don't know if you can see it through my camera. I'm showing it to you. No, we copy. So basically, the two black marks do not match up, correct? No. Not the way you want us to install it, uh, where the cord would be out of our way and clear of the installation surface. And, uh, Gennady, can I go ahead and turn on my sublimator? Yes, Anton, go ahead and turn on your sublimator. Well, thank God. Okay, so should we install it the way it was installed to begin with, or should we try and move it anymore? Anton, can you see if that tether is keeping it, uh, that's keeping it tight and not able to be rotated? Is installed on the right handrail? Yes, it's on 3121 the way you told us. But if we attach, if we would have attached it to the adjacent handrail, which is 3120, then uh, we would have been able to install it the right way. Okay, copy. Go ahead and reinstall it the way it was from the very beginning. Copy. Anton, go ahead and move it towards me, please. No, it has never been removed. It's always been attached to this handrail. Okay, so never been removed. Copy. Anton, so let's take a more careful look around. Right now, it's um, just hanging freely. Maybe we can move it the other way, the opposite direction 
Let me see where the latches are. Can't see them right now. Okay, where are the marks? Okay, I see the black mark that I'm working with, and I see the lock. So, mine, my end is in. Go ahead and close the latch. Is your latch closed? Uh, no, not really. Yeah, and the strap is out. Okay, and what is the strap that you were referring to? The cord, the cord that you were talking about, uh, uh, Misha. Anton, is your sublimator on? Yes, Anton turned on the sublimator. But, yeah, I turned it on, but I don't feel anything. Anton, I set your temperature to 2, so you can adjust it accordingly. And Misha, this cord is kind of budging and has more slack if we turn it this way. If we turn it the way we were trying to turn it previously, then it stretches all the way to the max and does not budge anymore. Okay. Well, it is attached on the other end to the handrail, so it's not going to be in your way all the time. So, Anton, go ahead and uh, proceed. Go ahead and take the... Um, we're still working on getting uh, that protective ring installed correctly, making sure that a cord that's attached to it doesn't obstruct their um, their passage through the pier's hatch. The International Space Station is currently about uh, 258 miles above the South Atlantic Ocean, just off the coast of Argentina and heading northeast towards the coast of Africa at this time. Copy. Today's spacewalk uh, began at 8.31 a.m. Central Time, and uh, once the crew gets out, they're going to begin work on uh, relocating one of the two Strela cranes that's attached to the pier's docking compartment, getting that uh, module ready for its eventual um, Deorbiting and, and uh, Anton, release from the station. Install, uh, the first spring tether to you can see here where those cranes are located uh, currently on the left hand side of the screen. Spring tether also. And you can see how the, uh, the cranes will be located. At the end of uh, this task, where uh, the first of the two cranes will be installed on the Poise Mini research module. So, and then. Uh, just the safety tether, uh, I cannot reach. Misha, I need to egress all the way in order to reach. Just want to make sure that Manasa was just uh, securely attached and does not uh, come off of the tether. I'm sorry, Anton, could you say your last, please? Yes, I'm trying to make sure that uh, Venosovist assembly does not uh, come off the uh, short tether to which it's currently secured. It's not going to be possible, Anton. You're, you're okay. Happy. So, Moving towards the first Strela. Yeah. Anton, uh, can you stop, please, for a second? For some reason, we're not receiving uh, any view from your cameras. Um, could you try to make sure that they're actually on? <laughs> I pressed the button. Anton, what's happening? Misha, are you hearing me? Yes, I have you loud and clear. Alex, how about you? Well, my light is still on. Okay, and uh, I pressed my button, and uh, the green light is no longer lit. And uh, do I need to press it again? Yeah, it's basically like power cycling. I turn it off and then turn it on again. Okay. Pressing the button one more time to turn it on. Okay, very good. Anton. So when you press the button, 
And a green light comes on. We're not receiving the video yet. And uh, we need to figure out where Strela 1 is located at this time and then move towards the uh, mobile link 1. Copy. Beginning to... Uh and, uh, Misha, do you want me to power cycle my camera as well? No, you don't need to do that. I think you've done that before, Oleg, and uh, just leave it the way it is right now. Copy. Spacewalkers beginning now to actually leave the pier's docking compartment. Get ready to get to work on today's six-hour spacewalk. Again, it started at 8.31 a.m. Central Time. So we are 18 minutes now into the six-hour spacewalk. Okay, so the first mobile link and uh, one of the tethers goes to the boom of Strela 1. Copy. And uh, resilience or Venoslavist assembly is installed on the first link of the mobile. Uh, the, the mobile link on the first Strela. Okay, and then I'm going to reattach or resecure uh, the tether to the uh, resilience or Venoslavist experiment uh, assembly tether. Yes, and you can install the other side the other end to the same uh, handrail. Yeah, can I do it on the adjacent handrail? Yes, that's fine. It's difficult to make out in this view, but you can just see some movement um, at the okay. top of the screen, uh, just a little left of the center. Um, where the crew is uh, getting out of the hatch and uh, beginning to get their tethers in the right configuration. And can I squeeze by you? Anton, where's my tether? Can you check? And uh, this one, meaning which one? One of the things blocking them from view is one of the cranes they'll be working with today. That, again, is going to be their first task to uh, relocate one of the two Strela cranes that are used during spacewalks from the Piers docking compartment to the Poist Mini Research Module 2. And, uh, Misha, I am on the EV letter at this time. Copy. Anton started moving towards the second Strela. Okay, Anton, uh, when possible, please uh, keep us posted on where you are and what you see okay. along your translation path. Anton, am, am I on your way in, uh, at all? I am moving along the uh, tethers that are situated around the hatch. Okay, Anton, did I understand correctly? You're moving it across the circumferential handrails, correct? Uh, yes, around the hatch. Copy. Misha, uh, just a question ahead of time. Uh, this tether needs to be detached and reattached to where? Which tether are you talking about? The one on the Strela. Okay, Oleg, you are currently next to the grapple fixture of Strela 1, is that correct? No, I'm giving way to Anton right now, and then I'm going to move towards there. I'm just asking to where to when I actually get there. Yeah, there is a tether on the grapple fixture, and uh, the other end of that tether needs to be secured to the strut with a ring. So that end needs to be attached to that ring. Anton Schaplerov, one of uh, today's two spacewalkers coming into view here. Today is actually his um, his uh, first spacewalk to be involved with, in, so he's getting his first chance to uh, try translating outside the station in microgravity. And, of course, he will uh, be accompanying today by 
Oleg Kononenko, who is uh, performing his third spacewalk. He's got 12 hours and 12 minutes of spacewalk time already under his belt from two spacewalks he conducted on during Expedition 17 in 2008. Copy. And uh, which tether did you use? We also hope to get soon uh, some helmet camera video from the two spacewalkers, uh, giving us a closer look at what they're actually working on throughout the spacewalk. Okay, so now I'm moving along the slide wire. Yes, and uh, you will be translated towards the um, handrail. Yes, and I'm um, now next to the um, EV2 hatch, the second EV hatch. Copy, and Alec, where are you? I am uh, next to the base of the operator post. And here is that promised helmet camera view. This one is actually coming from uh, Shkaplerov as he makes his way towards the second Strela, the, two, the second of the two cranes on, attached to the pier's docking compartment. Uh, the two spacewalkers are going to be difficult to tell apart today because they're both wearing uh, Orlon spacesuits marked with a blue stripe. Those stripes are dictated by the um, the number of the space suit, uh, even numbered suits get a blue stripe and odd number get a red stripe, and uh, these two suits both happen to be even numbered. Um, so instead, uh, we will be able to tell the difference between their helmet camera views by the number you can just make out embossed on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And move towards Shkaplerov will have a will view marked with the number 18, and Oleg Kononenko will have a view marked with the number 20. Okay, well, I'm basically moving to where Anton went. And Anton went... Actually, can I translate behind the operator post? Anton, how did you get where you are? Alex. Yes, Misha. Uh, what do you have for me? Yeah. Alex, if you're not too far away from the hatch from which you egressed, please uh, use the handrails that are next to the hatch. There's a uh, a lonely uh, handrail, 3025. You can use it. Yeah, and actually that's the one I'm holding on to right now. Okay. The next uh, handrail will be 3024, and it's uh, going to bring you towards uh, the circumferential handrails. Okay, and this is uh, taking me away from the operator post. Is that correct, Mr. That is affirmative. Okay. Copy. So I am going to go the opposite way of where Anton translated. See, because I'm supposed to free up the first trail and then I'm going to be moving away from it. But uh, when we actually came out, it turns out that it's better not to go away from it. Okay, so I reattached it, but I'm still looking at it and it's probably going to take me under the boom. No, you don't need to go under the strella. The circumferential handrails will lead you towards the uh, grapple fixture. And then you are going to be... You hear now from Oleg Kononenko's helmet on. camera. Again, his is marked with the up. number 20 embossed on the lower right-hand corner of the screen, as opposed to Anton Skaplerov, who is uh, using a camera, a camera mark number 18. Okay, and Anton, how are you doing? Okay, so I am next to the mobile link. On the first trail is the safety tether of the mobile link, and one of the hooks is uh, attached to the boom itself. And one end of the tether is attached to the handrail on the boom. Yes, and uh, Anton, this hook now needs to be a attached to the handrail on the boom, which is the closest to the grapple fixture. That's correct, and that's the circumferential handrail. And this is the tether that is securing the mobile link. Copy. Then go ahead and install the tether on the uh, grapple fixture of the mobile link at this time, Anton. 
the tether is installed. Copy. Into the eyelet on the grapple fixture, and I am going to... Install the uh, retainer or restraint at this time. As you can see Anton Skeptorov here working with uh, one of the two Strela cranes that's attached to the Piers docking compartment. The crew is uh, working first of all to get the first Strela ready for its detachment from Piers so it can be reinstalled on the uh, Poise Committee Research Module. To do that, Skeptorov is uh, releasing some tethers and other restraints uh, holding it in place while. Uh, this is Gennady, actually. Kononenko should be moving to the, uh, the base plate so that he can get into right, place to actually control the Estrella as they the uh, unfold low. it and telescope uh, it out. At the very bottom, but uh, I am very comfortable. We might raise it to four. I have. Okay, thank you. Anton, everything is fine right now. You're on time. Anyhow, when you're done with all the activities, I uh, suggest uh, that you wait. Uh, don't rush. Uh, after I said, you've got the lanyard, uh, but you don't need that. Uh, your operator post is underneath your seat. Feet. Uh, so I need to continue on the uh, circumferential handrail. Yeah. Can I attach to the uh, lanyard after the escape like I said? Yeah, I c you can. Good. Proceeding. And you will have a radial handrail, which you can attach to. Misha, oh, we're getting pictures. Excellent. Could you tell us how uh, well or easily could you did you release the tether from the handrail that it was attached to? Uh, 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 could you repeat your last well? Uh, tell us how you uh, released into your... Uh, Transportation configuration. I released easily, no problem. I thought that uh, there should be, uh, there would be some effort, but I moved it and it uh, released. Misha, a question. My handle uh, of the second Strela is in full open. As far as I recall, it should be open. When uh, you install the extension, it's supposed to be in the middle position, the open position. But what about right now? Does it matter? Or shall I uh, place it in that position? Anton, the base handle should be in the open position. It's in full open. Well, move it to open. Set. The retainer is installed and hand tight. I'm getting a wrench and tightening, torquing it down. Before you do, which way uh, is the uh, screw facing that you're supposed to be tightening? There are inscriptions there. Uh, the inscription says full open. How copy? Copy. Good. It's going to be difficult for me to look up. Anton.
Oleg, while Anton is working, find yourself a convenient position to operate the controls. Uh, it looks like I am okay, but when I raise my head, it's hard for me to see. Uh, it's always my left hand. I will have to uh, rotate the controls with my left hand. Uh, we'll see. If there's no rush. Well, then there will be no rush. The retainer is installed and tightened down. Copy. Mishi depends on your body position. I was uh, hoping to uh, be head up, but I was the other way around. So when we uh, went out the EVA hatch, I was hoping to go left. So when I rotated, the picture went upside down. Uh, I, my suggestion was uh, for you to rotate with your feet towards the uh, foot restraint. It's supposed to be underneath your feet. It's over uh, my head right now. Uh, am I removing the retainer rat? Yes, please. Rotated mission. This is more convenient, but still I have to raise my head high. Understood. It's better, but when uh, I was on my side, it was great, except I would have had to operate with my left hand. Uh, we would like your tethers to be secured to different handrails. Okay. Your tether is around the circular handrail. You have the handrail close to yourself, underneath your uh, left arm. We are talking about you. What about what about me? What I was saying is about the. Uh, uh, I can see that your tethers are secured to the same handrail. They should be secured to different uh, handrails. Uh, it, they're different sections. Go and change that. I attach the short one to the strella. What about the long one? Can I attach it to the lanyard uh, on the strella? Yes, you can. Uh, securing the Strela. How copy? Copy. The Strela cranes are used similarly to how we use the uh, Canada Arm 2 on the U.S. side of the station, the robotic arm uh, that allows uh, crew members on spacewalks to uh, be flown around the station. These aren't exactly like that. They're more like cranes. The crew member, though, would be on the end, and uh, he could be maneuvered around different positions within their reach to give him a little bit of... Uh, so in order to larger area that he can access, you can attach yourself to the handrail closest to you. I'm at the grapple fixture area in order for you to move, you need to open the lock. There is one lock that you can open up. It's next to the handrail. And it's adjustable tether. It's number one. Can you extend it? Uh, 
So I'm looking at the adjustable tether right now. Okay, I am checking opening and closing at the mobile unit, at the grapple fixture. Well, currently, you don't need to check it out. You will do it later. Just now, move it apart. All right, copy. What is inconvenient for you? Well, I was just saying it, it's more convenient to do it now. What you can do now is the lock. It's actually an orange handle with a ball. You can move it out. So am I correct that it's on my right? There are two positions, open and close. And you will see an arrow. An arrow will point to the open position. So that's what you need to do. Can you open it freely? The grapple picture, picture is it free? Yes, it is. So look at uh, labeling number two. So please check the movement. How is it moving? It's moving freely. And the grapple fixture unit is in place and it's moving freely. Copy. So now move it apart. Okay. It has been extended. Okay. It should be extending. Absolutely. These Estrella cranes are uh, generally and left folded up wire. on the surface so of the station, not extended the as they are when they use, so you can hear them so talking about, first of all, installing an extension. That's uh, kind of the second half of the crane, and once that's installed, they can then extend it and allow the crane to telescope out. So that's what the uh, crew members are working on. Again, they need to get the, the uh, Estrella that's going to be used to actually move the one that's uh, being relocated, um, get that all extended so it has the reach it needs to uh, remove the Please do the um, second Strela, or the first actually Strela 1 from the peers module to the poise mini research module. You can see how that uh, actually works in this animation. This is the uh, in extension being installed and there one end of it telescoping out and then a second end will telescope out as well. Right now you go to the mobile unit and uh, extend it to 90 degrees. So it should be extended. Okay, look at this handle. You should be rotating it. Copy. The mobile unit. So move it to 90 degrees. Please keep commenting. So this is the pitch position. So this handrail should move up and down. So that's the handrail on the right. Just m move it to the side, Anton. At the grapple fixture, you will see a handle, and you need to do the same thing on the mobile unit. You will see a handle with a ball. You'll see labels open and close. And you should... Unintelligible. So you should move it forward. Are you successful? So it should go up and down. There are two positions only. Anton, do you see the handrails right now? So just move it to the right and extend it. Anton, Anton do you see the DC shell right now? Yes. All right, we're moving it forward. Unintelligible. Okay, now help with your feet. Okay. So up to 90 degrees. So you should be moving it up to 90 degrees. So up to 90 degrees, that's all we're asking you currently. Anton, after you finish working with the mobile unit, please don't tight it hardly. Don't tight it to the hard stop. Just do a little bit. Soft tightening. Right now, okay, let's 
Okay, Try again. Okay, I'm holding it right now. Yeah. Okay, it's it's not holding on itself. So is it being locked? Is it in place? Completely in place? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Now it's moving. Fabulous. Okay, now it's moving to the progress. So it's the progress. Okay. Okay, I cannot do it right like that. What is uh, preventing you from doing it? I am attached to the mobile unit. Okay, on this side. So I'm on this side. I need to attach to something. Anton. Right now, we'll be rotating to the opposite side, to the other side, Misha. Anton is holding to this side, so we are rotating it to the other side. Okay, then we have to tighten it in place. Okay, Anton is securing it in place right now, but don't tighten it up. Understand. Okay, now moving to the operator's post. Then, unintelligible. Okay, you go to the operator's workstation. All right, I will do that. As you can see, we're getting video now from the station and can uh, get a better idea of what uh, the crew members are up to on orbit. That's good. View is uh, looking directly at the, the slide wire. Can I attach to the docking compartment where the two spacewalkers kind of are? Uh, looks like I getting the the first strella ready uh, and secured to, to the second strella so that it can be moved. Well, you see this handrail, and uh, the slide wire should be attached. Well, a wire tie, and look at the hook. Okay, Estrella has so much stuff on it. It's unbelievable. Well, Anton, I'm trying to attach it. Misha, please check your camera. And uh, I'm checking the hook right now also. Excellent, Anton. We can see you. Do you hear from uh, Anton Skaplerov's camera? He has that uh, up close look at the surface of the Estrella as he. Anton. And Shkaplerov work on it, or he and Konninko work on it, rather. Yeah. All right, now. Anton, can you please comment on what you can see right now? I see cities under me. He's either a philosopher or a poet. What, the, what else am I supposed to see? Well, the worksite, maybe. The structure. We're interested in what you see in terms of the structure. Well, am I correct in my understanding that we'll be extending this trailer right now? Okay, now we'll be uh, we'll start the motion. Not much. The closest structure I have is the FGB solar rays and MRM one, and nothing else that might be of a hazard. Anton, yes. Please tell me, can you? See have a good view of DC-1 shell solar rays of the FGB US radiator. Solar rays I can see. The radiator is a little bit far away. I can see it, but it's a little bit far away. Yes, it's in the visibility zone. Okay, you can start moving slowly and steadily. Yes, the solar rays are in a good view. Right now. Okay, I'm trying to control the movement and let me rotate. Let me move around. The ring will stay in place. 
Uh, the pressure is zero three eight. Oleg, have a look. The mobile unit has uh, uh, an ability to snag itself upon something. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So we need to be very watchful. Okay, and the extension, I'm, I'm not sure how far should I extend it so you'll be able to extend it to the m magnet lock. Okay, let's extend it a little bit and then see whether we need to adjust it. Okay, let's do it. Can you feel it? Guys, can you tell me if you see the PHO? No, I'm facing with my back, and we're extending it forward, so the opposite direction. Unintelligible. Go ahead. You need to figure out which plane you're facing the mobile unit. Well, let me have a look. The mobile unit is uh, pointing FGB right now. So if you're interested whether it's plane 4 or 2, then it's towards plane 2, where we have cupola copy. So the mobile unit should be lowered towards the DC shell. So um, after you move it... Uh, beyond the workstation one of this trailer. So, Anton, in this case, we need to move it 90 degrees to the left. I just don't see you. Team on the ground in um, Moscow I mean, working to get kind of a working knowledge of exactly where the uh, Strela is located and pointing at this point. No, I uh, heard the mention the FGB. We call that uh, the Zarya here, and it said it was pointing towards that, and of course right. the DC is the Pierce docking feet? compartment. Okay. Face towards me, so my feet are facing DC. Okay, understand. Okay, so please uh, start moving it towards this rotation, this location. Well, I think we need to roll the mobile unit. It should be moving along the roll. Well, just be careful. Guys, can you hear me? Yes, we, do. we can. All right, have a look. When you start rotating it, well, I'm not touching you right now. Okay? Right now, you should rotate the mobile unit along the roll axis. Copy. So, so FGB will my, touch FGB then? No. Well, just rotate it. And we need to stabilize uh, it along the roll axis, the grapple fixture. Well, there is a lock, or the angle lock, as it were, so it will help you stabilize. Well, that's the one that we'll be, we were rotating it, so we kind of locked it. Well, we should have locked it in the opposite direction then. Right now, the flag that you see, you need to move it to the roll axis. Well, right now, we're very close to FGB, so let me move Strela to the left a little bit, so that'll be better. Anton, please tell me. Okay, Misha, let us move uh, to the left, away from the FGB. Copy. I have a question. From what I can see from the camera view, the anchor or the, the lock that you see kind of went, uh, slid behind the handrail. So that is uh, not correct. We should take it from under the handrail. Okay, is that good? That is good right now. Make sure that both locks are located vertical. 
So are they still in place, both of them? Yes, they are. So if they are moving or sliding, then you should tighten them up. Okay, I was able to touch one. It's nominal. Let me touch the second one and check it. Well, as far as I could tell, it's stable. All right, so now we are rotating it along the roll axis. You rotated it too much along the roll axis. Well, the mobile unit, are we going to release it? We don't want to touch FGB. We understand. But you're a little bit too far. So now we need to start moving it in the opposite direction. Stop. Just stop. I'm stopping. Misha, am I correct in my understanding that one of the lockets works along the roll axis? I understand, but you need to move it to the open position and then move the mobile unit along the roll axis. Okay, we'll try. We'll do our best. And Anton, just be careful. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. And it's not going to touch it. In order for me to rotate it, I'll need to move it in the opposite direction. Okay, I'm raising it. Shall I come closer to you? Well, it stopped rotating. Okay, it's holding along the tether. Okay, now the cover turned forward. Well, and it's not rotating anymore, so that's good. Misha, we cannot open it fully. As you mentioned, there are two positions, open and close. So the ring is in, a, in the way. Can you see it? Oleg, I can see it. Oleg, where are you right now? I'm at the operator's post. Copy. So please monitor. Make sure that the trailer structure is away from FGB and it's parallel to FGB. Well, let us release the mobile unit. We want to move it just to make sure. Well, and uh, Misha, I cannot uh, fix it in place because uh, everything is rotating. I don't have a lever or anything to kind of stabilize it. Am, am I clear in my explanation? Understand. So basically, it's uh, very close to the progress. Do you see the mobile unit? It's facing the progress right now. Shall I continue in the same direction? Well, basically, you should uh, in the same uh, direction. Well, something is in its way, so I cannot do it. Well, crew still working to get uh, stroller number two. It's going to be used to kind of do the heavy lifting for the spacewalk um, into place and uh, ready to grab onto the stroller number one. It's going to be moved to the Poise Mini Research Module. You can see in this view um, Oleg Kononenko at the base of stroller two at the operator's post, as he called it. That is uh, where the actual maneuvering is done. From what I can see, the mobile unit is uh, facing uh, towards the vehicle. Oleg, are you still rotating me? No, I'm not touching you. I'm not moving you. Do you need me to move you? You here shows uh, the progress uh, 46 that's uh, docked to the Fears docking compartment. The, right, but the mini research module that the, um, the right crew is going to be installing the well, stroller number one onto is, is directly across on the other okay, end from the Fears docking compartment. Oleg, Anton, okay, have a look. Uh, the mobile unit is here. So we are in this position, and it should be in the opposite direction. So uh, you, you see your feet and just bend it this way. Well, well, right now it's facing the vehicle. 
Well, shall we move it along the roll axis? Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, it's moving freely because it's not uh, secured in place. And I cannot do anything because all the structural elements are rotating too. Anton, you should move the mobile units towards the FGB uh, about 45 degrees. Uh, which plane? Relative, uh, relative to Strela. Well, right now, you are moving it towards the vehicle. Do it the opposite. Yes, the opposite direction. Good. That's very good. That's the right direction. Okay, thank God. Okay, about 30 to 40 degrees more. Do you understand that I'm secured to it and I cannot be rotating because I have nothing to hold on to? Okay, let me extend my hand to you and you can hold on to me. Okay, these are your feet. Are you ready? I don't understand what you want to do. Well, you said you wanted the lever, a shoulder. Okay, just hold on to me. Shall I move it up or shall I move you down? Which direction would you like me to pull you? Anton, uh, where do you have these suit feathers right now? Where are, what are they attached to? One is uh, attached to the mobile unit. That's a short feather, and the long and uh, is on the strela. Okay. If you you need to rotate a bit more. Well, uh, I can try, but don't want to touch FGB. Anton, you can reattach your tether to a different lo location. Anton, yes. So, uh, take your tether, your suit tether, from the mobile unit to the Strela boom. But then it will move away because right now it is uh, holding on to me and I'm holding on to the boom right now. Okay, well, I'll do it, what you recommend. Anton Skaplerov and Oleg Kononenko still working to get the... Uh, Right Strela 2 crane uh, uh, maneuvered into uh, the right position the to uh, that's where you need to get the Strela 1 unit. Um, installed onto the shall, shall I lower it? Poise well, Mini well, Research you Module. Again, you can see Oleg Kroninko right. here at the bottom center of the screen where so he is at the, the opera Strela? operator post of the no, crane the where Strela. the controls are to you maneuver it. And Anton Skeplerov at the center joint. Sure, we are not too close of the crane. Again, they're working to get it facing pretty much in the opposite so direction right now, that it is so now. Um, it's parallel at this moment with the Progress 46 vehicle, and uh, they're working to get it pointed towards the Poise Committee Research Module, which is uh, directly across from the Piers Docking Department on it, uh, that it's located on um, from the from the Progress. Okay, right now I bend it all towards FGB. Just be careful. Uh, don't come too close. We are close. Oleg, uh, you're moving the boom towards FGB a little bit. Well, we're trying to place it in parallel. Okay, basically it's in parallel right now. Copy. Oleg, can you see it? The mobile unit 
is uh, in the opposite direction, and I don't see it. So shall I lower it? Well, I'm rotating together with uh, the boom and very close to FGB. Anton, let's do this. Well, the orbital day is about to begin. Don't be in a hurry. Let's wait for the sun to come up. It will be easier for you to see. You'll see. Well, Misha, I see everything. I see the boom very well. It's not uh, locked. Uh, it's not secured to the mobile unit. So it keeps rotating. So what do I do? Well, I can see it. Anton, right now, uh, lock the handle along the roll axis. But see, I cannot do it because I'm holding on to it right now. Anton, I'm going to get closer to you, and I'll probably have to hold you in place while you're turning the handle. Yeah. Everything that I'm holding on to, this is Anton, uh, are all rotating mechanisms. Oh. You should have calculated ahead of time before we started and uh, figured out how we can restrain me in place while I'm turning it. So I think I'm going to turn around all the way. Yeah, hang on, Anton. I'm getting uh, closer to you. I will keep you in place so that you wouldn't have to turn uh, in the same direction as the handle. Anton. Alex, you're uh, translating towards Anton right now, correct? That's affirmative. You get a slight view here of what they're trying to avoid. Um, you can so see in the top right. kind of uh, right-hand corner of the screen is the Zarya module that they are wanting to be real careful not to hit with the end of the crane. You can see it gets kind of close there as they continue to try to maneuver it into the correct position for a... Uh, uh, the work they're going to be doing to move Strela 1 from the piers docking compartment where they're currently located to okay, so uh, the like Voice Mini research the module, which is not in view okay, in this on. in this screen. Uh, so the mobile link is now pitched down. Is that right? Yes. All right, and uh, I am restrained in place. Anton, so... Okay, I... Set it to closed. Is that good? Yeah, don't uh, tight, tighten it uh, too much. And uh, is it secure? It's secure, but it's a little closer to the FGB than I'd like it to be. Yeah, but as long as it uh, doesn't get close to the radiator, uh, I, I think we're good. Do you want to pitch it down a little bit more? Uh, yeah, let's try. Okay, and uh, my feet are restrained, so we're good. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, check the roll. So this is the FGB. Let me get out of the retainer. Uh, can you m push it towards me? Hang on. Did you uh, restrain it at all? No, I didn't, but it's not budging anyway. Yeah, I, I don't think you are in the restraint. Oleg. Okay, so, Oleg, are you unable to restrain the mobile link? No, no, we moved it a little closer to the FGB. So... Hang on, let me hold it. Oleg and Anton, you have a good position uh, for the mobile link right now, so can you try and secure it in place? Okay, let's try one more time. No? Not happening? No, it's stable, it's, it's not moving, but it keeps rising. Let's leave it like this. Is it restrained? Yes, I think. Should I let it go? Yeah, you can let go. 
And can it turn a little bit more along the x-axis? Well, I thought I rolled it, but I can do it more. Yeah, while it's in this position, uh, you can uh, roll the mobile link a little bit more and set it to the right roll setting. Okay. View here from uh, Anton Skeplerov's helmet camera. You can also okay, so see uh, in his view um, Oleg Kononenko working together with him, still working to get this uh, crane maneuvered into place. Not on my side either. And here is uh, the view from Kononenko's camera. You can yeah, also see Skeplerov. It has a play. It, it keeps moving back and forth, but it, it doesn't turn where we want it to be. So it's, it's kind of like sliding or slipping. It cannot get to the right position that we need to restrain it in. Can we move it down in this position? Alex, leave it in this configuration, go back to the operator post, and then you will lower it towards Strela 1. Because uh, once you're on location, you'll be able to figure it out better. Okay, can you move it a little bit more towards me? So you don't want to restrain it? No, we need to restrain it. Alex, so can you turn it as, as much as you can? Much better. So let's, let's do it like this. Secure it in place. Nope, it's unfolding. It's unfolding. Anton, go ahead. Anton, just leave it in this position. Secure the config and and let's keep moving. Yeah, I need to restrain it in place. I don't want it to keep going back and forth. Misha, give me one second. Misha, can you hear me? We're a little over an hour and a half into today's spacewalk, which is yeah, scheduled to last six hours. I'm Crews uh, where I need to currently turn it so that it doesn't move out about of the um, an hour behind their their timeline, and uh, still working to get this crane into place for the maneuver they need to do. Also uh, orbiting about 225 miles above the South Pacific Ocean and just crossed into the daylight portion of this orbit. Along the roll. Okay, let's leave it where it is. Do not do anything else. Go to the operator post. Okay, Misha, go into the operator post. Yeah, let's leave it like this, then we will lower it towards Strela 1 uh, once you're on location. Okay, on my way. All right, so we probably need to move it away from the panels at least. Misha, question. Go ahead. How is the Strela going to be rolling? Because I understand that only the grapple fixture will be rotating roll-wise. No, the very last link of the boom will be rotating along the roll. Okay, the last link on the boom is not rotating. It, it won't turn. Just the grapple fixture, Misha. Okay, Anton, please don't do anything else with it right now. Please go back to the operator post, and we'll take it from there once you're on the operator post. Okay, Misha, that's fine. Alex, this is good enough. No, look at the panels. Alex, don't. No more. Okay, and I'm going to pitch it down now. Yes. All right, let's roll. View here from Oleg Kononenko's spot at the operator post as he uh, works that. Uh, 
to yep, extend the boom. And Alec, are you making sure that you are pitching down with the right rate? Yes. Right, and you need to pay attention to where uh, the uh, grapple fixture is uh, turning. Right, well, it's moving towards the latch, but the mobile link would need to be rotated roll-wise, counterclockwise, uh, relative to the boom. For some reason, at this point, in the dislocation, I cannot turn it. it. It won't turn. Do you want me to try? No, not right now. Don't do anything for now. All right, so the target is right underneath. Yes, but you are to the side of it, so you're still clear. Good tolerance. My idea is okay. to use this Strela crane, Strela 2, to and pick up Strela 1, which is also located on the pier stocking compartment, and uh, are, use it to uh, maneuver to Strela 1 About over to meter? its new home Maybe. on the Poisk Mini Research Module. 70 centimeters. Am I clear? Yes, you're you're good. The tether is pretty short. In the closed position, uh, roll-wise, for it to be rotated, the handles are pressing against it, and they're not allowing it to turn. Misha, based on what I understand from what Anton is saying, uh, the stoppers or the handles uh, that are required to move this safety ring. Yes, go ahead, please continue. So judging by what Anton is saying, okay, uh, and now a little bit to the right. Alec, uh, I just uh, deployed the last link uh, of the mobile link as much as possible. Do you see uh, the camera view right now? No, not right now. Uh, you can give me a detailed commentary on what you're seeing. Stop. You're stopped. Okay, so I'm trying to center the grapple fixture and the mobile link on the ball. Anton, so you're trying to center on the ball uh, the uh, grapple fixture of the mobile link, is that correct? Yes, that's right, because I figured out why it wasn't rotating roll-wise. Because the stopper restraint, which is securing in place the last link, it was pressing against the safety or transportation ring. So we kept turning it, and then once letting it go, it would travel back to its original location because it was basically not allowing it to remain in place. So we're trying to remedy that right now. Copy. All right, a little close to the target. Should I pitch up a little, Anton? Hang on. Well, the uh, target is relatively close, depending on what it is that you're planning to do. I, I think my tether is a little too short. It's kind of pulling me down. Okay, do you want me to unhook you and uh, rehook you to a different location so uh, you have more slack in your tether? I can do that, no problem. Anton, please tell us how we things are with you. I have nothing new to tell you right now.
Hold on, Misha. We are testing. Is that going to work? Yeah. Start uh, moving, Oleg. Okay. Misha, we are going to test it. Guys, this is SRP. Please uh, listen to recommendations. Copy. Okay, do uh, another uh, wrap around it. It's tested, yes. Anton, the objective for you is to hold it in this position. You will hold on uh, with one hand to a handrail and then hold this. I am uh, drifting away. When you're holding on to a handrail, are you, do you also drift away? What about this uh, position? Well, you will hold on with one hand to the uh, handrail. Uh, I do not have strength enough uh, to hold the suit uh, with one hand. Please note, you don't need to uh, hold on to the point where your knuckles go white, but you just need to uh, guide against the handrail. Oleg, uh, you follow the slide wire. Uh, that's okay. Although that's more slow, uh, that's slower. But uh, at least on the uh, on the way back, you're going to be flying. down slide wires. Uh, attach yourself uh, right away to the EVA 8 to the handles. All right.
точка, вернее, постоператор от точки далеко не ушла. Антон, can you tell me whether the operator station is too far uh, from uh, the pointer from the base? No, it's not too too far. It's uh, flying away. Yeah. Flying away, yeah. I'm uh, uh, closing in. It's not too, uh, not a problem because it's uh, secured. Uh, something is. Uh, Uh, come to me. I'm um, um, feeling motion against my backpack. Okay, uh, turn around. Maybe I'll try and move over. You hear from Oleg Kononenko's uh, helmet camera view as uh, he makes his way to the other end of the uh, Strela number two crane that he's been operating with uh, Anton Shkaparov on the end. Um, moving over to the Poisk module where uh, he and Shkaparov will work together to install the Strela number one crane. Away from Anton. I am going to uh, locate uh, to the handrail that's closest to uh, 6040. Uh, I am attached to 6025. Uh, does it not say 6040? No, no. The uh, label on the Handrail is 6025. Uh, is it a regular handrail? Yes. Uh, what can we come up with here? Uh, can you attach me to the lower handrail? Can we attach to the operator station of the first trailer? Of course you can. One has to be on the MRM, on an MRM handrail. The other can be attached to another handrail. It's attached, right? It's not going anywhere. As long as they are going different directions. Anton? No. This is uh, in the way. Let me uh, attach it to you. It's uh, on the spindle here, on the tether here. I don't need it on this tether. Anton. Go ahead. Okay, we're both inside and we can start inventory. All right, let's start. Oleg, we'll start from you. Swing, arm and tool caddy. Okay, let me start. I have a dinosaur cutter's the camera here. Uh, one red will have test. Plus, in addition, I have uh, the variable tether. Everything is attached to red. And you have red, small, small? Oh. Yes, I confirm, small, small. One uh, dinosaur cotton, one empty, and the camera and the tool caddy. Copy. Anton, now you 
Madam you should have three armors, yeah? One each. Uh, confirm. Two KD, one. Confirm. View here inside a, a through Anton Skaplarov's helmet camera. Crew uh, back inside the pier's docking compartment now and going through an inventory of the tools they took out with them to make sure they are bringing them all back in. Again, today's spacewalk doesn't officially end until the the hatch on the piers is closed. So the range. So the wing nut and one is uh, vacant. So there should be three of them, right? Well, did you copy what I've said? Anton, please uh, confirm you have three small, small reds. Yes, I do confirm that. Copy. Very good. Let's start to remove the protective ring. Alex. The tether is next. Can you hear me, Alex? What? Your tether? Is it your tether? No, it's your tether. And it's uh, in the way of the ring. Alex and Anton. We're getting the view from your video again. Good for you. Can you move the tether out of the way, please? Uh, is uh, the swing arm completely covered? Yes, it's completely covered, Misha. Misha, it's covered. Copy. No, Anton, not that way. Alec, why don't we just install it and, and we'll figure the rest later. Alec and Anton, go ahead and turn off your sublimators. Let us uh, finish the thing we're doing with the ring first, and then we'll take care of the sublimators. And you said we can turn them off, right? Yes, please. Enough. Okay. Anton, when the ring is removed, could you inspect the uh, seals, please? On my side, everything looks good, Anton. This is Alex. Yeah, I think I want to wipe the side of the surface that I'm looking at uh, with a towel. Okay, and uh, Alec, make sure that the, the hook is not impacting anything because the, it's attached still over there. Yeah, the, the red is kind of hard to detach. I keep trying to open it and springs back. Okay. Yeah, just make sure that it's not anywhere where you are working. We don't want it to get anywhere it's not supposed to. Copy. Okay. Are we going to turn off the sublimators just to double check? Yes, please go ahead and uh, turn off the sublimators. Okay, well, I, I think this is enough. My sublimator is off. This is Oleg. When the towel, the towel is on the right. Do you see it, Anton? Uh, yes, I see it now. Okay, go ahead and wipe it. At six, PET of six hours, 12 minutes, sublimator is off. Copy. Both of the sublimators are off at this time, is that right? And uh, Anton, what are you doing right now? Uh, we're wiping the seals. They have some sort of white residue on them. We took the towel for that purpose exactly with us, or are we not doing something that you wanted us to do? No, guys, everything's fine. Just just keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry about it. 
Ну да, определить то, чтобы все нормально было. Yeah, we just want to make sure we have a good seal, um, so we'll wipe off the residue. Six hours and two minutes into today's spacewalk, uh, the crew's been given the go to close the hatch on the pier stocking compartment, which would mark the end of the spacewalk, but they uh, wanted to take some time and, and wipe off the uh, seal on the hatch before they actually did that. So okay, should yes. be coming up on the end of it any moment now. Okay. Setting up to turn off the sublimiter. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, Alec, can you turn off my sublimiter? It's the, the last switch. Okay, and did it beep? Yes. Okay, then my sublimiter is off. Copy. Gina, six hours, 14 minutes. Is that a PET for the EVA, or is it the duration that I've been inside the suit? This timer starts from the moment you transition to suit standalone power. Copy. Understood. Олег, Ан... Антон. Uh, Антон, did you stick your head out of the ring? Yes. Okay, can you go back in, please? Миша, I am inside. I am inside. I just wanted to stick my head out to look around just to make sure that we got everything we had to. I understand.
what do you see on your counter there? Eight. Again, I have 10 minutes of drying. So, Norma. Norm. Okay, we'll wait for Anton. And as soon as uh, he says normal, nominal, uh, then now uh, we'll close the hatch. Copy. One more minute to go. Spacewalkers have uh, just a minute to go before they reach the 10-minute uh, mark. They have their sublimators on, at which point they'll be able to close the hatch on the Piers Docking Department, bringing the spacewalk today to an end. The official time that the clock will stop uh, will actually be when the hatch is uh, locked after they've closed it.
Олег и Антон, как у вас Ролики, похоже, зашли. Антон еще закрывает хатч, и роллеры, я думаю, в них. Копи. Как только трещотка начнется на ключе, когда вот уже грузишь его, так наша еще... As soon as it starts ratcheting, uh, remove the uh, hatch closing aid or hatch tool, uh, so it doesn't uh, spring back. Copy, it's removed, and the hatch is closed. Copy. Fall. Карабин фала по тягам возвращается в исходное положение. The adjustable tether hook uh, needs to be returned to its original location. It's already back in place. Copy. Олег и Антон, thank you so much for everything you've done for us today. You did an enormous accomplish. You accomplished an enormous task today. Moving the Strela boom, uh, and uh, all of my specialists uh, are expressing their gratitude for everything that you've done for us today. Misha, thank you very much for your excellent support and all your help. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you next time. I will hand you over to the to Gennady, and he'll take it from here. Some thanks and congratulations from the team on the ground in Moscow with uh, the closure of the hatch on the pier's docking compartment, marking the end of today's spacewalk that took place at 2.46 p.m. Central Time bringing the uh, spacewalk to a close after six hours and 15 minutes. Alec and uh, Anton, this is uh, Dmitry Zubov. How do you hear me? Dima, good evening. How are you doing? I'm great. I think we can press from here, guys. Um, I am going to guide you through the cue cards. Um, so please locate cue card starting with 4.14, post DVA repress operations. Can you confirm, Dima? I'm sorry, Alia, can you say your last again? Uh, there was a dropout in COM. Yeah, uh, guys, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, can you confirm that step 1.2 is already complete? The cue cards are in our hands, and we're next to the EVA uh, panel. Yes, so you're going to press on uh, with step 3 and uh, repress to 260. With the end of today's spacewalk, we have some updated stats for you. Um, again, today was the 162nd spacewalk conducted for space station assembly and maintenance, bringing the, uh, with the, this extra six hours and 15 minutes for today, uh, the total time spent spacewalking for space station assembly and maintenance to 1,021 hours and 47 minutes. Today was also Oleg Kononenko's third spacewalk. He conducted two during Expedition 17 back in 2008, and he now has a total time spent outside of 18 hours and 27 minutes. Today was Anton Shkaplarov's first spacewalk, so of course his uh, total is now at 6 hours and 15 minutes, the duration of today's spacewalk, which ended at 2.46 p.m. Central Time. To open, and uh, we confirm KVDPHOSU is open. The pressure is rising. Copy. Yes, and please report on your suit pressures, please. Yes, 20 meters in DC. The pressure in the suits is dropping, 0 0.35. Very good. Fifteen DC. Zero decimal three for both AV crew members in the suit.
100 millimeters in DC, zero decimal 25 suit pressure for EV1, for EV2 as well. Copy. Once again, the, the crew, the spacewalking crew for the day, flight engineers Oleg Kononenko and uh, Anton Skaplerov are both safely back inside the pier's docking compartment with the hatch closed, which brings uh, today's spacewalk to an end. Oleg, uh, what is pressure in DC? Spacewalk wrapped up at 2.46 p.m. Central Time and uh, lasted for a total of six hours and 15 minutes today. Just to go over the stats one more time, this was the 162nd spacewalk. Zero decimal one one four. And these added uh, six hours and 15 minutes bring the total time spent for uh, space station assembly and maintenance to 1,021 hours and 47 minutes over those 162 space station assembly and maintenance spacewalks. With Oleg Kononenko's third spacewalk added to his uh, two performed during Expedition 17. Now has a total spacewalking time spent of uh, 18 hours and 27 minutes. And uh, Shkaplarov, uh, having completed his first spacewalk today, now has six hours and 15 minutes to his name. Two, three, zero. Over the course of their six hours and 15 minutes, they uh, completed the move of one of the two Shrela cranes on the Russian segment from the uh, piers docking compartment to the Poisk Mini Research Module 2 that is in preparation for eventually uh, getting, uh, letting the uh, piers docking compartment uh, detach from the space station and uh, deorbit. That was completed successfully and uh, Although it took a little extra time, they were able to get a couple of the get-ahead tasks that were a possibility for the day done. This is Mission Control Houston. Welcome to today's ISS update for Friday, February 17, 2012. This is a live view inside the International Space Station's flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. This team here is being led today by Flight Director Mike Serafin, who is there in the middle. Sitting beside him is uh, Tony Sikachi, a former fellow uh, shuttle flight director. He is uh, also sitting on console, getting uh, trained on the space station and its systems. Sitting beside them uh, both as the Capcom today is astronaut Shell Lindgren. He is the uh, voice of the team here in Houston to the Expedition 30 crew aboard the International Space Station. There's a look at the crew. The crew has a very busy Friday on tap for them. Don Pettit, who's on the far right, has been uh, working on an experiment called SLICE. This stands for the Structure and Liftoff in Combustion Experiment. What it does is take a look at uh, how different flames perform uh, in space. Uh, there's a, a phenomenon called liftoff, which is where the flame actually comes up off the burner. And uh, this is caused by a series of different things, whether it's the uh, combustion elements themselves, uh, what makes up the flame, or uh, the different type of flow that is happening. Obviously, flames behave a bit differently up in space than they do here on the ground. But by studying this uh, liftoff phenomena, as we talked about, uh, it is hoped that uh, teams here on the ground can design better uh, products that have better fuel efficiency or uh, better combustion inside of them. Uh, Pettit is also working today on some routine maintenance on the robotic workstation that is down in the cupola. Uh, this is sort of the Windows on the World module of the International Space Station. There is a robotics workstation there uh, that is used anytime the crew is operating this uh, station's robotic arm. So he will take care of that later on this afternoon. 
Meanwhile, Anatoly Ivanishin, another member of Expedition 30, is working on opening the transfer hatch between the pier's docking compartment, which is the site of yesterday's spacewalk, and the Progress 46 cargo craft. Those hatches were closed, obviously, because the uh, cosmonauts were opening up the hatch on piers and decompressing it uh, so they could step outside. So they had to seal off that Progress cargo craft, which you see the layout of the station there, uh, docked back there with piers. So they will take care of opening that hatch back up uh, later on today. Andre Koifers is working on an experiment called MARS. This is the Mus Muscle Atrophy Research and Exercise System. It's uh, sort of an exercise system that you would, it looks like something you would find on the ground here in a gym, but operates a little bit differently. This uh, item measures and exercises seven different joints to see what happens uh, to the crew members' bodies as they uh, live up on board the International Space Station for up to six months. Monitoring the uh, body's performance and how it adapts to space is incredibly important, and one of the main things that the International Space Station is teaching us. Obviously, those lessons will be very important as humans venture beyond low Earth orbit and head to even further destinations out in space. Corpus is also working on the cabin fan assemblies and ventilation ducts there inside the Columbus module later on this afternoon. Oli Kononenko and Anton Chikaplorov are uh, taking care of quite a number of different activities today and also recovering from yesterday's spacewalk. That spacewalk lasted 6 hours and 15 minutes. They'll be talking with ground controllers today to review yesterday's spacewalk and uh, talk about everything that was accomplished. During that spacewalk, they completed the move of the Strela boom. This is one of the two large extension booms that are on the outside of the Russian segment of the station. They use these to uh, move around and to uh, gain access to different portions of the Russian segment. Strela 1 used to be on the pier's docking compartment, which is on the bottom side of the station, the Earth-facing side of uh, that part of the complex. They moved it up to the Poisk module, which is directly up above piers on the space-facing uh, side of the Russian segment. There is another boom called Strela 2 that is still down on Poisk. That will be moved, uh, down on piers, excuse me, that will be moved later on uh, this summer by a future crew. These uh, Strela booms that you see the crew moving yesterday are uh, being moved up to the top of the station to make way for the departure of piers. Uh, that particular portion of the station has been up there for more than 10 years, uh, and it will say goodbye as it makes way for a brand new multipurpose laboratory module uh, that our Russian counterparts will be launching uh, later on next year. Dan Burbank, the commander of Expedition 30, is working on quite a number of different experiments today, including MELFI. This is the minus 80 laboratory. This is a large freezer on board the station that is used to store uh, different types of samples and uh, experiments at uh, really, really cold temperatures. You're seeing a picture of it here. He is basically going to be doing a nitrogen pressure check just to make sure that that MELFI is operating as expected. He is also going to be working on an experiment called BCAT-6. This is the binary colloidal alloy test. And he and the rest of the crew members also have several different crew Earth observation opportunities today. They will be flying directly above Chile, and we'll have a chance to take a look down at the Woolia Cove. This is uh, an HMS Beagle uh, landing site. And they will also be uh, flying over the St. Helena Island, which is off in the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Africa. Of course, for all the latest uh, over the weekend on the Expedition 30 crew, you can just log on to the NASA website at www.nasa.gov station.